Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Okay, welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, I hope you're staying cool. You know, we're we are not down south up in the Texas panhandle or whatever, where people are looking at about a hundred degrees with the humidity and whatever. But I uh, hope you're staying cool here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm still reminded of uh, uh, former Governor Tom McCall for those folks down south uh, uh, visit, but don't stay because we don't want to make sure we get cluttered with the same heat. <laughs> but anyway, that was just a little short thing that I thought I'd, Tom told me to share this with you uh, right before the show about the heat situation. But anyway, um, well, I want to thank you again for being a part of the Oregon Voters Digest. And again, I make reference to the fact I want to thank the crew here at the Oregon Voters Digest and also thank you, the viewers who have been with us for a number of years. I mean, it's been quite some time. and Hopefully we've brought you some very interesting shows. And, and as you know, the format here at the Oregon Voters Digest is to educate and inform. Very important situation. And through the years, uh, we've done that. I think we've done that. Again, thank you for being with us. and. And hopefully you will, will continue to enjoy some of the subjects that we will be discussing here at the Oregon Voters Digest. Well, today we're going to have a we've got we've got a special today. I, I think uh, and it's very timely. Uh, as you note, um, the first African American elected to president of these United States, uh, uh, President Obama, has brought all sorts of of as put conversation. Let's put it that way. And I think it's good. It's good for this country because we need to talk about the issue of race. And then one of the things, however, in talking to the issue of race is that we need to talk about the history of race, uh, how it fitted within our, within our America, if you will. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to try to recapture uh, some of the, uh, uh, the er an era, if you will, of how blacks participated uh, during the formation of this particular country. Uh, from the from the institution of this country, i.e., the British, British, the British, the king, if you will, basically send a number of the destitutes down here to America to pick up some crops and grow some crops and send the money home and send the crops home. I mean, in a very lay fashion aspect of it. But anyway, but we've got someone here who who is a historian in his own right, and um, and this is my guest that was with me today, and and we're going to take advantage of that and spend some time with him. Uh, like all of us should be out basically trying to do this. But anyway, but this, this person happened to be a historian. He majored in history while he was in college, but he happens to be a local attorney. I'm talking about Herbert Gray. Herb Gray, and Herb is with us today. Welcome aboard, Herb. It's great to be here, Bruce. Appreciate it very fine. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to spend some time with Herb and, and get a feel of, of, of how African Americans participate, how they arrive here, that, that whole nine yard. And, and for those of you who are interested in doing more research, you may want to just take this as a as a reason to go out and, and do some research on your own, okay, to, to get a better feel of, of uh, what this was all about. Anyway, so why don't we start off by basically giving you a feel of, of who is Herb, and and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about his background, and et cetera, and then we'll just get right into the uh, into the meaning of what we're going to do today. Herb. Well, Bruce, I'm, I'm a guy who was uh, a interested in American history from when I was a little kid. I, I used to read biographies of the Founding Fathers when I was little. Um, I was kind of a nerd Born in that. Born and raised region. here? Eh? I'm, I'm an Oregonian, Oregon? native, okay. native Oregonian. And the thing is, I was always interested in history. I always wanted to major in history, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to earn a living uh, teaching history or doing anything, so I, I aspired to go to law school. But I never lost my interest in history. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I found as time has gone on, though, is that um, I spent a lot of time studying a lot of American history, mm -hmm. and I only got part of the story. And it's really been pretty recently that I started to fill in some of those gaps that I never picked up all the way through my elementary years and my secondary years in high school, even in college, and certainly in law school I didn't learn a whole lot of history that was very helpful. So. I'm, I'm amazed to have been interested in history for so long and yet only recently started to learn some pieces that have been missing all the way along. You know, I might, I might make a point, too. I, when you were talking, making small talk right before the show, I was in the same boat. I was born in the South, born in Louisiana, raised in Texas, in Houston specifically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was always participating in the Juneteenth kind of a deal, but it was just a festive kind of a deal. 
And, uh, and but now to date, I had, like you, I had to come all the way up to Portland, Oregon, and start getting into wall builders and getting into that history, and then the Buffalo Soldiers and the like. And right. and then and th- started thinking back. There's no monument to Major Granger, you know, the one who basically marched into Texas because the South was a little slow about making sure that African Americans were free. Remember Long that? way from Washington D.C. You, you understand, and there was sure. no monuments in, in in Galveston. There was no monuments at the state capitol, even to this date. And right. so now I can understand why southern states never put that in the history books or uh, uh, basically uh, tried to educate the, popu- uh, the population as a whole right. as to that history. There's a lot of history there. and so Well, you know, they always say that the victors write the history. Yes, the problem yes. is the history is written, yes. but the information hasn't gotten to people. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And I think that's true for almost all of us who have right. grown up... Uh, you know, in the since the 1960s, 1970s, um, we just don't know this stuff. Right, right. Well, look, let's get right into this uh, right off the bat here. Let's uh, let's get right up in the. I think that first question was, is the Constitution pro-slavery or anti-slavery? Can we just start with that piece? Well, the classic way that that's presented in school, and this is true in uh, junior high and high school, and even in college today, is that the Constitution is. Um, is pro-slavery, and usually what everybody refers to is what's called the Three-Fifths Compromise, which is in Article One. And the way the story goes, the Three-Fifths Compromise happened because everybody thought that blacks were only worth three-fifths of a, per- of a white person. Mm-hmm. That's the way it's taught, mm-hmm. okay? And since most of the Founding Fathers were white guys, and they were classically educated, and all of that, the white guys decided that blacks were worth three-fifths of a, of, of a person. They were second-class citizens, and that's the history of our country. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, and you don't have to take my, my word for it. Frederick Douglass says, I wonder what the real deal was here. So he set out to study that himself. An African-American. An African-American. That's right. Remember the Lincoln-Douglas debates he right. was in with right. in the 1850s with Abraham Lincoln and so on? And what he found out was, like a lot of things, there were political compromises along the way. Three-fifths had nothing to do with the worth of an individual. Nothing at all. Hmm. What everybody was confronting was the reality that for many southern states that depended upon um, slave labor at that time because the king insisted everybody have slaves, that um, they would, there were a lot of black slaves. Mm -hmm. So if you worked out representation based on the sheer number of people, the southern states were going to have an incredible amount of political power because they had more people. So what the founders decided to do when they're trying to hash through this whole (laughs) constitution thing, they said, how do we set this up in a way to keep the power between the, the, the various states as equal as possible? Hmm. And we got the three-fifths compromise. Was that about making black second-class citizens? Nothing could be further from the truth. What it really represented was, let's balance the power between slave and non-slave states and give everybody more or less equal representation. Otherwise, the South, the South would have had majority, right? That's right. And then the South would have called all the shots Mm -hmm. and said, guess what? Everybody's going to be a slave state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what the founders were trying to head off. And and again, you know, Frederick Douglass had grown up and he was an educated man. And he'd always been taught that the Constitution was putting the black man down. Mm -hmm. And when he actually looked at what the historical record was, he says, no, it's completely the other way. Well, what what did they miss during that particular time? You know, he's educated, but he was from the North. Right. And then all of a sudden, boom, we got this whole issue of the slavery, this, that, and the other. But he was not recognized as such in the North. Well, I think part of it is that he recognized that there might be more to the story than what he'd been taught. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how you and I started this program today. Exactly. We've spent years becoming educated. We're involved in paying attention and what's going on in our society. And yet... We haven't heard the whole story. And Frederick Douglass, clear back in the 1850s, figured that out. So he had the same problem we did. Yes, yes. (laughs) Let's talk about... uh the, the history of, of slavery, if, if mm-hmm. you will, or the history of the, of the, of the of blacks in that particular. Let's see, going back to the King Day, I mean, how did that all come about? Well, 
you know, a and lot of people... We're talking about Britain. We're talking about Britain, England, yeah, right? Yeah. A lot of people like to point to the founders, uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and all those guys, and say, well, they were all s slave owners, so obviously they were pro-slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, what everybody has to keep in mind is the whole reason that North America was... Um, was colonized in the first place was because the King of England granted charters to certain people to go to certain places and do certain things. And one of the things that came with the charter is, guess what? You're going to have slaves. So for those people who want to say that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and others must have loved slavery because they had slaves, what that overlooks is they didn't have any say in the matter. They were told they were going to have slaves, and the economic system, based on those charters, was set up that way. So they had slaves. Were blacks the only one identified as slaves in that charter? I, I, think, that's, I think that's true at that okay. point in time okay. because, of course, colonizing North America, right. at, at least the East Coast, was pretty much a European sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. And England was kind of leading the charge with that. So the, the truth of the matter is, if, if you dig into the historical record, George Washington wasn't really keen on having slaves. But he also recognized he had a responsibility to him, and as long as the law required him to have them, he was going to take care of them. And in fact, at different times when he was off helping to found the country and fighting the Revolutionary War and all those kinds of things, he was paying to keep everybody afloat back at Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. So far from him considering his slaves to be second-class citizens, they were valuable uh, people to him, mm -hmm. and he took care of them. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to understand that the King of England was really kind of calling the shots during this whole period of time. And it wasn't until we declared our independence that we even had a chance to say, we want a voice in whether or not we're going to have slaves or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when that issue came up, again, getting right, as you say, when that issue came when did it come up about approximately? Well, it was always an active discussion. Okay. But you know, at the time of the Declaration of Independence in 1770, right. all men are created equal. Right, right. Well, even at that point in time, everybody understands, well, we have to pay attention to whether or not all men are really created equal right. and whether we are going to build a country based mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot going on. I mean, you can imagine starting a country from scratch and you're, uh, you know, fighting against the biggest power in the world, mm -hmm. has a bigger navy, bigger standing army, all of those things. Frankly, we kind of had our hands full. And they were pro-slavery. Yeah. So what happened ultimately, a lot of states decided on their own after independence to prohibit slavery, or at least the expansion of it. And where that first pops up, uh, if you get outside of state charters and so on, where that first pops up is in the, uh, in the original Constitution adopted in 1787, there was a provision that says for 20 years, we will allow slavery to continue. But in uh, 1807, we're going to have a conversation. And in the meantime, we're not going to expand slavery beyond what it is now. We will just allow it to perpetuate for the next 20 years, then we'll figure it out. Well, we never quite figured it out, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that was the idea that of the idea. founders at the okay. time. Okay. So even in the original Constitution of the United States, there was an effort to say, we kind of need to stop this slavery thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now we've gotten, we're, we're approaching now the Civil War, so to speak, or the cause for the Civil War. Aspect right. Of it. So now all of a sudden the introduction, if you will, of, it, uh, of slavery is brought up again, if you will. Right. It was more of a democratic uh, kind of a controlled Congress and this, that, and the other, right? Well, th that's true. And really the first half of the 1800s, we were trying to figure out kind of what we were going to do. I mean, in 1820, there was the Missouri Compromise that said, okay, every time we admit a f slave state, we're going to admit a free state. Okay. okay. We're going to keep things in balance. Well, it wasn't until the 1850s that uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act came along, and it's like, you know that Missouri Compromise thing? That, we're, we're not interested in that anymore. So again, with the Democrats in power, they, they passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which said that basically any, any state that wanted to be a slave state could be a slave state. And, um, and so that's when this whole kind of balance of power started to break down and really focus the issue on slave versus free states. And then there's this young guy by the name of what, uh, he was a lawyer by the name of Lincoln came up in the press. Yes. 
How did that come about? Well, 